Sennheiser is one of the industry leaders for wireless audio, which is why I've got John McGregor with Sennheiser here to help us understand the fundamentals of wireless, why we use it, and how it works. It's just about convenience. It's making life that little bit easier, that little bit simple to work with because you're not worrying about cables. And you, your talent, whoever you're interviewing or whoever's on mic is freer to move around. That's that's definitely true for both a video situation like this and live production yeah. Yeah, where somebody you know doesn't necessarily want to have <laughs> unless they're doing the you know the spin it around well, yeah. spin the mic around yeah. on the cable but um, having that mobility. Something else for video specifically though is that right now you can see with a wide frame these microphones in the shot. Yeah. And luckily, you know, we're in a situation where we can get nice and close and sort of cut these out, crop these microphones out so you can't see them. There are different ways we can use wireless in audio though. And two common ways would be obviously microphones. So getting audio from a, a person talking or from an instrument wirelessly to your mixer. Another way to do it though that I didn't learn about until I started really getting into professional audio is the other way around. So let's say I want to send audio from my console to a musician who's on uh -huh. stage so that instead of using a floor wedge yeah. for monitoring what you know the performance sounds like they can just use in-ear monitors yeah. and in that case we would have like a belt pack uh -huh. similar to this right here yeah. the signal flow will be the same no matter what you're doing in general whether you're doing a wireless input uh -huh. or a wireless output yeah. for a, for a monitoring mix but let's start with the most common like uh -huh. a handheld wireless microphone transmitter yep yeah. that inside it has you know the microphone a pre-amplifier mm -hmm. and then it has the transmitter itself yeah. which is going to modulate the signal yeah which we'll, some, we'll get into in a second do some magic and some magic yep but we're going to try to demystify that yeah. in, in this video so then that modulated signal would be broadcast mm -hmm. through the antenna that's yeah. also built into that yeah. handheld so that that microphone is a microphone but it's a lot of other things it's as well things, yeah. That signal then gets broadcast and there's also an antenna on the receiver. Two antennas. Two antennas. Yeah. The receiver can come in many forms. We have these more portable types, mm -hmm. but in a live situation or you know something for theater, they yeah. would generally be like a rack mounted unit. Yeah. Those have antennas and inside the receivers, they have a demodulator. They do. Yeah. That's going to take that RF signal convert it back into an audio signal mm -hmm. that spits it out yeah. and it goes into your mixer or into your recording yeah. device. And you just treat whatever. it like you would normally treat a cabled signal, basically. And then on the other end, it's basically that in reverse. Yeah. Our console sends audio out to the transmitter that's maybe a rack-mounted yeah. unit. It has an antenna, it sends out that modulated signal, and then we have something like this, a belt pack yeah. receiver. Someone's wearing it on their belt and it obviously captures that through the antenna demodulates it and sends it out a little headphone yeah. output here. And you've got a little volume control yeah. on it. Make it as loud as you want or as quiet as you want. So we've sort of been saying modulation, demodulation. Mm. And I'll be honest, when I heard of AM, amplitude modulation, mm -hmm. FM, frequency modulation, I understood that that's how the radio works, yeah. but I didn't understand how those things actually work. Yeah. Can you help me understand what modulation actually is? Yeah. So obviously what we're doing is we're getting our audio into our microphone capsule. That then goes through the normal audio process that you're aware of. It will get pre-amplified to increase that volume coming out of the bottom of the capsule. And then we have to have some way to convert that into a stream that we can broadcast over a radio signal. So if we go back to the, the old days, I won't say the bad old days, but let's go back to the old days of analog wireless microphone systems. We would have a frequency modulation device inside our wireless microphone. And what that is doing is it's literally taking the vocal audio. So if we're doing a singer here, we're taking the vocal audio and it is modulating the transmitter frequency. So with every wireless device, we have to have a frequency that we tune into. That's the, that's the frequency we're gonna transmit at. That frequency then has a specific bandwidth. It's allowed to be modulated within uh, 200 kilohertz, roughly there. That means we can, with our audio signal, we can modulate the center frequency, which is the frequency we've booked into our receiver and transmitter, and then it will modulate that. It will modulate that frequency based on the audio that is modulating. So that gets modulated, you get that stream, the receiver will pick up that modulated signal. It goes, okay, I know I'm picking up at say, let's say 432 megahertz, 
and I'm picking up and it's doing this, it's modulating backwards and forwards, that is my audio signal hidden and modulated and encoded inside my transmission frequency. That makes sense. And yeah. that's, I think, an important distinction is that even though your carrier frequency may be 432 megahertz, yeah. the channel itself, that, that is the, the bandwidth yeah. that's used to encode that audio signal, isn't just at that specific frequency. No, no. So there's a difference between the carrier frequency and the channel. Yeah. Can you talk more on that? Well, it is that. It's, it's simply to allow ourselves to have the space to encode the audio into our radio frequency spectrum. Uh, working with national organizations that look after frequency coordination and so on, so the FCC in America uh, and other world regulators, we many years ago we came up with a format that said, okay, you are allowed to modulate that within a 200 kilohertz window. So 100 kilohertz from the center frequency, which is your booked frequency, and 100, uh, 100 kilohertz above that frequency. And that literally means that we can then, within that, modulate everything we need uh, and transmit that out. So nice and simple and everyone follows the rules. So that means, you know, you can have channel upon channel upon channel with some caveats. Obviously, we'll get into this idea of frequency coordination later. That's a whole different ball game. But because everyone's doing 200 kilohertz window transmission windows, then we know that we all have that bandwidth to transmit in yep. or to modulate and to transmit. So that limit where we're restricted to plus or minus 100 kilohertz, mm -hmm. that has implications on the dynamic range. Yeah, it does. Right? Yeah. And so we basically know that we can't have a wider bandwidth for any given channel than that. Yeah. So we sort of have to work within those, those limitations because yeah. that's the law yeah. in a lot of places. Um, there are certain things that we need to make sure on the audio side, that's sort of the law for professional audio. Yeah. Um, and that gets into the CIR, mm. right? The carrier, carrier interference to interference ratio. ratio. Yeah. Yeah. Can you help us just understand briefly what that is? That's more down to the technicalities, the, 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 the physics of transmission. We, we need to make sure that whenever we're transmitting, that we have a strong enough signal that the receiver system can pick up. Now, the airwaves are full. Um, it's something that we're fighting, uh, not just us as a wireless mi microphone manufacturer, all the wireless mi microphone manufacturers are out there fighting uh, against mobile phones because the mobile phone industry is sucking up our airwaves and obviously we still need TV channels being transmitted. So it's getting very crowded. Because of that, what it means is, is the airwaves themselves are very busy and very noisy. To ensure that we have a good enough transmission signal, we have to make sure, depending on the system, depending on the uh, transmission elements we use, that we have a certain carrier to interference level. So the carrier always has to be a certain amount higher, ratio-wise, than the interference that will naturally exist. I mean, even cosmic waves from space will cause interference. It's, it's, a, it's a noisy space. You know that when you tune your car radio, if, you, if you've still got an old analog car radio, when you choose your car radio, you get static between the channels. It just is. Uh, lightning does it. All, uh, loads of things interact to make the noise. As long as we can ensure we have that higher ratio of carrier to interference, we will have good transmission. As soon as they come closer to each other, depending if you're using an analog or digital system, you will get things happening. Uh, analog systems will become noisy and they will begin, you'll begin to hear, oh, I'm getting either too far away from my channel here, and this is normally a distance thing, but that does impact carrier to inter interference ratio. Um, and you begin to get noisy and you begin to go, okay, I'm needing to do something here. I need to either get closer to my receiver or maybe I need to choose a different channel. Digital systems are a little bit different. Digital systems work, 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 stop. But again, it's linked to this carrier to interference ratio because we have to ensure that we have a strong enough signal without static and interference in there that can corrupt the signal we're trying to send. Which is why, especially with older analog systems, you do hear that hissing noise begin to come in as your carrier to interference ratio drops. Yeah. Simple as that. And it's kind of intuitive for us as audio people because yeah. we are dealing with signal to noise ratio all yeah. the time. 
And you can liken it to a tape hiss or a really noisy room. Like yeah. there's noise all around us in audio, yeah. just like there is noise all around us electromagnetically yeah. with RF. Um, but with audio, I guess if at a certain point your signal will just be buried in the noise. Yeah. With wireless, it's really important that the machines are able to detect the changes that we're encoding yeah. into these. Yeah. And that sort of gets me back to the three parts of a FM system, mm. the, the carrier, mm -hmm. that's that frequency that is at the center of our channel. Yep. The modulation that occurs, so the audio signal modulates that frequency, mm. which represents the audio signal itself. Yep. And then the detection mm. circuit, which is basically the demodulation yep. in that receiving end. As we're talking about the noise, We've got to talk about the squelch just mm. briefly. On a lot of wireless systems, you will find uh, on the receiver, the squelch control, and it's a odd term, but we use it. Squelch basically means it's a, no yeah, it's a noise gate, and it literally says everything below this frequency, uh, below this frequency, below this uh, noise level, I will not transmit from. And it comes from the classic situation of, you know, you're using a wireless microphone system, and it's on, still a relatively noisy channel, but you can use it because you've got greater carrier to interference ratio. And for some reason, the talent turns the microphone off, or the transmitter off. And all of a sudden you get this rush of noise coming through your transmitter because the transmitter's gone, oh, I'm looking for signal, I'm looking for signal. There's signal here, boom, and it'll play out these static burst, which is just irritating as hell. What we can do with the squelch is we can help with that noise floor. It helps during transmission as well. It means that you know the system will work quite happily above this level. It will only hear the transmitter. Uh, and then, yeah, anything below that just gets ignored. It will not transmit uh, any signal coming in below that threshold. Um, and it does mean that classic situation of someone turns off the transmitter and you get this rush of static through your system, which is not a good thing to have at a venue. No, no, you don't like big random bursts of sound. No. Um, so ultimately, the transmitter is trying to send as clean a modulated signal as possible, mm -hmm. and the receiver is trying to work with as clean a version of yeah. that modulated yeah. signal the, as possible. The receiver will just receive signal. It doesn't yeah. care. Um, and that's why we need to use things like Squelch to help it be aware that, you know, my transmitter is going to transmit at this amount of uh, level, uh, anything below that level, please ignore it because that's not my transmitter. That's something else. This is this is this this is the whole thing with RF. It can seem complicated, and, and to a point it is, but it's 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 much like it's much like a mixing console. Once you know one channel, how one channel strip on a mixing console works, you know how the whole mixing console works. Once you understand just a few small principles of being very aware of tuning in to an empty channel that is as clean as you can possibly get it, and which is why. All, all of us as manufacturers, we put multiple um, preset channels and banks inside our systems so that you do have that option to move around. So that's the general principle. Mm -hmm. um, but if you d dive a little bit deeper, we've got these different principles that also vary depending on what yeah. frequencies we're using. So the first thing is propagation. Yep. Can you help me understand that? Yeah, propagation is literally uh, how the radio waves move around a space. Um, uh, very much like sound waves. Uh, obviously, you get reflections, refractions, diffractions uh, as, as the waves move around uh, your space. And it will interact with what's going on uh, in the space and the waves will interact with each other. Um, and it's something we have to be, be very, very aware of is when we're setting up, which is one of the reasons why uh, on receiver systems we'd like to have two antennas, preferably spaced at a specific distance related to the frequency we're working with because it then means that depending on how that wave is propagating through space, you may find at the receiver location at certain times as the transmitter moves that you get null points. We don't mind so much boosted points. Boosted points are okay, so we don't mind constructive interference, but destructive interference is obviously gonna be a problem. If I have two separate antennas that are slightly spaced, even this on this system here, that is potentially enough space for those two antennas to have a good signal, but a bad signal. And therefore my system can switch backwards and forwards between the two different antennas to choose the strongest signal to keep my uh, reception level as good as I need it to, to pick up. Bringing it back to audio, it's similar to like a room mode. Yeah. Right? If yeah, you, it's if you play a tone in your room, 
especially in the low frequencies, mm -hmm. and you walk around, you'll notice at some point it, it disappears. Yeah. And at some point it's it's really yeah. a healthy it's level. It's basically the same thing. Uh, there's also a difference between how effectively low frequencies can penetrate through mm -hmm. a, a barrier. Yeah. Uh, let's say it's it's uh, of wooden construction yeah. or metal construction, that has something to do with it. But generally speaking, lower frequencies can penetrate through any barrier. Mm -hmm more effectively than yeah, I mean, that's why we have the debate the ongoing debate even though we make a 2.4 gigahertz wireless microphone system uh, we always recommend to people who want to do more professional stuff that you go with a uhf system down in the you know 500 600 megahertz range because you know we all know it from home 2.4 gigahertz wi-fi you go upstairs <laughs> your internet's gone um and yeah it's just it's 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 a it's neither a negative or a positive. It just, it's just part of pure physics. We have to deal with it. We have to be aware that it's there. Um, and again, it's something that you need to think about. Again, it, sort of, it, it goes back to that annoying thing of it. it's potentially adding to the complexity of using a wireless system, but not really. Once you know what you're dealing with, um, you can make informed decisions on what type of system you're going to use, how you're going to use it, where are you going to use it. And it's just, it's just thinking. I mean, it's, it's even the same with that, the microphone cable. I'm going to use a mic cable. Have I got power supplies running across the floor? Is my mic cable good enough to go past all these power supplies? It's the same debate, just in a different setting. And to bring that into maybe your setting, watching this, if you're working at a, a rock festival or a house of worship yeah. or something like that, and, and your musician is on stage with the mic, and it's a big stage, and you're already sort of at the limits of these higher frequency systems, and then you've also got, I don't know, like some racks to to penetrate through, or it's in a completely different room in, in the server room or something like that. Um, basically, the lower frequency protocols will be more effective for longer distance and going through barriers and such. Yeah, to a point. I mean, at the end of the day as well, if you're getting into that kind of situation where you are in a house of worship or a concert rig, you will be using remote antennas. You'll deliberately be using remote antennas because very much like working with a shotgun microphone, you want your, in this case, your transmission source to be as close to your reception source as possible. That is always the name of the game. Just like in audio, make sure your microphone is as close to your audio source. With wireless microphones, make sure your transmitter is as close to your receive, well, reception path as possible. Yeah, we can use long cable runs and things like that, but yeah, there's also drawbacks to that. I, I think it's really helpful to think intuitively about RF mm -hmm. and audio, yep. right? So the further away the microphone is um, from the sound source, the quieter yeah. the sound signal will be by the time it reaches that microphone. The same principle applies here. You want really to be within at least the specifications of your wireless system, yeah. but to a certain point, the closer the better. Yeah in terms of that signal to noise ratio. Yeah. Um, the same thing could happen for cable loss, mm -hmm. like from your remote antenna going to your receiver, there's attenuation just yeah. like there is of audio. And then the same analogy even continues when you think about like acoustics and those reflections you had mentioned, these cancellations can occur. So um, I think it's really helpful if you're coming from an audio background because it all makes intuitive sense. Yeah, it's all it's, it's all electromagnetic waves at the end of the day. Uh, acoustic waves are very, very similar. All of this is great. And we could then say, knowing this about higher and lower frequencies, we want this range. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, that's not how it works. No, um, it's, not. it's not just our system, first off. If you're at a festival where multiple different companies are running wireless systems for microphones, for in-ear monitors, you're going to need to work around those people. Yeah. But sadly, the audio world, the professional audio world, isn't really the most powerful force when it comes to the FCC in the United States regulating which frequencies can be used mm -hmm. by who. Yeah. And so it's, it's not just us um, no. as audio professionals. We've also got digital television. We've also got yeah. 5G networks. And yeah. each year, it sort of changes just the legislation mm -hmm. around which frequency ranges we can use. Yeah. Where are we sitting right now with which frequencies can be used for our purposes? <sighs> well, it, it, it actually depends on what part of the world you're in. There are what we call ITU regions. So there's region one, region two, region three. Uh, Europe, and well, EMEA is region one, America is region two, and APAC is region three. If I remember my numbers correctly, I'm horrible with numbers. <clears throat> 
but it means you know within a set spectrum so we would normally think of 470 megahertz up to about 700 megahertz as being the, the standard um, wireless operating range in america that is severely restricted uh, there is a lot going on there's a lot of digital television as well which is now coming in not just in america but around the world that is eating into this space it can seem as a very arbitrary um, process where we as manufacturers sort of just get railroaded by mobile phone manufacturer or mobile, mobile phone carriers with billions of dollars to spend and to buy space but i do have to admit that the fcc and other world organizations do listen very very carefully to us um, as wireless device manufacturers because not just wireless microphone systems there's other stuff in there as well radio communications that um, emergency services use military services use, et cetera, et cetera. We're all fighting for this space. Yes, it's been restricted. Yes, we don't have as much as we'd like. And we're always, every couple of years, of this thing called the World Radio Conference, where, and there's one actually this year uh, in 2023, uh, where they'll all get together, all the world organizations will get together and battle out who's going to get what kind of, we make it a battle, but it's not. But at the end, at the end of the day as well, we as manufacturers are adapting to that. So we're moving away from the older analog technologies. We've moved into digital technologies, which become more spectrum efficient. And that is the name of the game. I mean, it's being spectrum efficient, using the spectrum we have to its maximum potential. We can't realistically fight back against this restriction of airwaves because we have to be aware that, you know, these other devices, so whether it's 5G when and this whole development of the internet of things. So we need that space. That is gonna bring profound benefits for us as individuals, but also for us as a company. So yeah, we can say, ooh, can you just be, you know, just to be a little less generous and make sure we have that. But at the same time, we, we're very much aware of, okay, well, there are things we can do to be, as I said, spectrum efficient, um, to make sure that potentially this other stuff that's gonna be developed and put into these uh, wireless frequency ranges is potentially something we could then turn into a product and use those spaces and become a new way of doing things. And by spectrum efficiency, it's like, we know we have this bandwidth to work with. How can we fit more channels into yeah. that that we have? Yeah. And I suppose it's not all bad. Yeah. I would rather there be regulation than just complete randomness. Yeah. And it's nice to know that when we come into the show um, in a live sound situation that at least 5G is not going to be broadcasting where we are. And at least uh, radio stations won't be broadcasting where we want mm -hmm. to work. Yeah. There may be some TV stations. There yeah. may be other people's um, devices. But it's already thinned out to the point where we, we have solutions where we can work around yeah. that. However, if you've ever used wireless microphones over the years, you know that it's not always that simple. You don't just always set it up and you're good to go. Yeah. You may have experienced dropouts and interference. In the next video, we're gonna talk about why that happens and propose some solutions mm -hmm. to make sure you can avoid that happening right in the middle of your show. So don't miss it. You can click the video that's on your screen.